Hi, everybody. I, my name is Omri Ben Shahar. I am the professor of contract law here at the law school. I see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you for subjecting yourself to yet another day of contracts. <laughs> um, and uh, I uh, want to talk to you about today about uh, one of the themes that I am recently been studying, which have to do with consumer law, consumer protection, and consumer contracts. Uh, much of the work that I've been doing in this area uh, is being done with uh, Oren Bargill at the New York University. Uh, um, uh, and some of it has to do with other things that I have presented in forums like this and to my classes, my work not with Bargill on disclosure uh, and my skeptical view about uh, mandated disclosures generally. Today I'm not going to sing the same you know, tune regarding disclosure, but talk about other aspects of consumer protection. And if you want to, to, to uh, just a general direction of wh where we, you know, in what sense this is different, you can think about two, that maybe the two most important ways of helping people out when they face difficulty, say, when dealing with more sophisticated, more uh, savvy, at, uh, transactors with businesses that know more, there are two ways to do it. One is to give the weak, the uninformed uh, uh, consumers information. That's the disclosure device on which we will not say anything more today. Um, the other is to give them the right to exit. If they are unhappy, they are not stuck. They don't need to know anything. They just can flee. And that is what, uh, this is the uh, uh, regime I'm going to talk about today, the idea that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to click dark so we can see the display. And I'll, I'll give you, so why am I calling this no contract? I was struck in the last year or two at the uh, rise of this uh, phenomenon, of this term, of this marketing device. Call it whatever you want. It is this. Here's a, an ad to sign up for internet service, no contract. <laughs> it, in fact, it happened three years ago when I moved to a new residence in Chicago. I called Comcast and asked to sign up for their triple play or whatever they call it. And they say, they told me, sir, we have something better. We have the blah, 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 no contract. I said, what? I said, no, we offer you, there is no contract. I said, I told them, just a minute, I, uh, I think there is a contract here. So no, 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 there, there's no contract. I, said, Look, I teach contracts, and I'm telling you, there is a, mm, they wouldn't budge. Uh, there is no contract. And uh, I thought, you know, OK, it's just a Comcast kind of sales rec rec you know, um, recitation. But it isn't. It's, you know, you find it on billboards. Here's a picture. We, um, High-speed internet, no contract, this is not Comcast, it's someone else. And then, in fact, you see it everywhere with iPhones, not just with telecommunications, by the way. Here's a few images uh, that you can find. If you click no contract on the web, uh, on Google Images, you'll see millions of these types of things. You know, no contract with a sign of uh, 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 no entry or uh, something like this. No more contracts. That is some other service. No contracts necessary. This is not even telecommunication, something that's called SEO. I don't know what this is. Um, need a no contract phone? You know, tear the contract. <laughs> um, so, and there are plenty others. Uh, the, there is a very interesting issue to explore here, which I am incompetent of doing, and that is the underlying sociology. What is going on? What does it, why do people, why are people afraid of the term contract? Contract, we sometimes teach, is the ultimate security. It gives you the sense that you are, uh, you know, you've got a commitment, that you've got rights. Contracts was the great innovation that made trade possible, that made growth and wealth possible. And yet, in the consumer world, it's, we are averse to it. It's, it's a bacteria. And uh, we, it has to do, with, and I think we all know where it comes from, but there is a richer account to, 
to draw and to develop, and I'm not going to develop it, but just to suggest that it has to do with things like the um, adversity to uh, aversion to fine print. Why we don't like fine print because fine print is legalese. It's something that lawyers write not to protect us, but to protect someone else. That usually what we find in the fine print, if we ever looked in it, is you know un uh, unpleasant stuff. It's not more things that we are entitled to, but more things that we have to pay to do things we thought we had, but we don't, ways in which what was promised can be taken away, our, our, the great sense of helplessness when you are a consumer facing a stronger business party is all kind of encapsulated in the idea of the fine print, the boilerplate contract, the uh, terms and provision that people don't like. Because this is never good news, there's never good news there, we don't like it. And if we don't like it, we have a no contract arrangement. Now, but this is law school, this is not a, you know, a kind of a sociological or some other kind of a, a informal discussion. And we know that in law school, you know, in law, the no contract term is a misnomer. There is a contract. There is a contract and there is a, so what is this no contract? Well, what it really means is that there is no future commitment by the consumer. You're not locked in. You can walk away. That is the idea of the exit. So termination without a termination penalty. Uh, switching to other services without switching costs. And here we're talking about there are switching costs that are non-legal. Getting used to a new network. Getting used, you know, familiar familiarizing yourself with the alternative product that you might be switching to. These are real switching costs, but there are no legal costs, no fees, no artificial barriers. It does mean that you have to pay for what you already receive. There is a contractual obligation to pay. Pay as you go. And there is contractual obligation, you know, there's a big, long, fine print in those no contract contracts. Right? Uh, with all the stuff that we don't like. Like binding agreement for mandatory arbitration. Something that recently consumer advocates have become very unhappy about. Um, there are all these familiar disclaimers of warranties and, and, and all that stuff. This applies to those retrospective portions of the transaction. Whatever you already consumed is subject to these terms, but you don't have to stick around. There is free termination. That's what a no contract will mean. I think that's what it means in all of these arrangements that we saw all of these ads, and that is what I'm going to talk about today. And I want to confront it with the other uh, species of consumer contract, the lock-in contract. So all I'm going to say in the next 15 minutes is, you know, how to, which one is better? And it turns out it's not as simple. You know, one might have the conjecture that if consumers are trapped in a lock-in contract, it's kind of open season on them. You know, can do what businesses can do, many nasty things. This is a misguided conjecture. If there is a problem with lock-in, it's more subtle. And in the, uh, the, so the first observation, uh, the first several observations we can make, which are fairly robust when you compare lock-in versus no contract, both theoretically and empirically, if you look around, you will see the following things. First of all, in the lock-in period, imagine that you enter a two period, there are two periods of consumption. Early on, the sign-up period, the upfront period, and the next period, the long term, the second year, whichever it is. In the second year, in the next period, lock-in will enable the business to charge higher prices. They have, in effect, created artificial market power. There could be enormous competition in the market, but the consumer is trapped because of these $200 switching fee. So that $200 can be squeezed out, milked out of the consumer by higher fees and charges. Not, you know, they can't do whatever they want. 
there's always the option of termination. The businesses cannot <laughs> take full advantage. There's no absolute market power, but there is some significant market power to the degree that it is costly to switch. So we can expect higher prices in the subsequent period. The second year of your Comcast, lock in Comcast, you'll all of a sudden see, oh, you no longer have this low introductory thing. Now it's higher, and this is the effect. But of course, anticipating this, the businesses will want to bring in consumers whom they can exploit down the, down the road in the subsequent period. So they'll fiercely compete over attracting those consumers in the first period, in the sign-up period, with all sorts of discounts, lower price in the sign-up period. Teaser rates we see often, free gifts, come join us, we'll give you something of value that you can use right now, bundled products, join us for two years, you'll get a nice big, you know, flashy phones with lots of lights. Uh, <laughs> but, and this is, you know, to some people it might be surprising, but upon a little bit of reflection, it is almost obvious that, and that is, I call it the basic insight here, the same total cost for consumers. It doesn't matter if you are in a lock-in or a no contract, whatever you get, end up, however much you get screwed in the lock-in, you get upfront as perks. Whether that is true, whether it is a monopoly or competitive market, the ability to take advantage, to charge consumer price over the entire life of consumption doesn't uh, vary across uh, regimes. This is the, the intuition. The upfront discount is anticipated and is exactly offset by the subsequent uh, 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 it exactly offsets, subsequent charges are anticipated and are exactly offset by the upfront discount. So if that is the case, if it is invariant, if it doesn't matter, if you pay just as much, why does it matter? So I want to say something about these basic invariance irrelevance arguments. <coughs> They're always wrong, but they are very important methodologically. It's like many of you have already been uh, uh, taught the Coase theorem. The Coase theorem is the greatest irrelevance theorem of all time. It says the law doesn't matter because parties can override inefficient law and transact into efficient. So there's a mathematical proof that it is no, whichever tort law you have, whichever contract law you have, it will not change. We will get to efficiency if transaction costs are low. What does that teach us? It doesn't, it's a very important correct observation, but it teaches us that if we are to find some differences, if we want to understand why the law matters, it's not, it's not the obvious places that we have to look at, but the more subtle areas, like which legal regime creates, in the Coase theorem, which legal regime creates higher transaction costs. Which legal regime operates, interacts with some type of transaction cost to bar the efficient outcome? This is true for every invariance result. It's true for those of you who are more fluent with finance theory, with the Modigliani-Miller um, capital uh, uh, um, structure idea. It is uh, when, when, a, when an irrelevance claim is made, it is only meant to direct attention to th something that would otherwise remain obscure and unnoticed. Those more subtle reasons, those more subtle issues are the source of the discrepancy between different legal rules. So why does no contract matter? Why, does it, why might it be worse or better, more likely better, than a lock-in arrangement? <clears throat> so first, let's think about the, assume that people are completely rational. I'm going to... Then we'll talk about imperfectly rational individual consumers. But even if consumers are perfectly rational, no contract will be, can, might be more efficient. Think about what happens under lock-in. Under lock-in, we have artificially low prices up front, the teaser rates, and, and then artificially high prices at the second period. Both create distortions. When prices are too low, people consume too much. 
people are consuming, even though the value to them from consumption is greater than the cost of production. Because they don't care about the real cost of production to the producers. They care about the price, and the price is artificially uh, low. So there is excessive demand in the original, in the upfront period. And then there is too little demand at the subsequent high rate second period. That's a distortion. There is a problem of inflexibility. Imagine that you've, you're locked in with a particular uh, provider with AT&T, but it turns out that Verizon is better for you in year two. Because let's say you moved to a di different part of the country and AT&T doesn't have signal there. So you need the flexibility to switch. Or let's say that your, some other entrant is offering a better product in year two, a brand new technology, which you want to be able to enjoy. You can't, you're stuck another year with your lock-in arrangement. All of these are inefficiencies that even rational people might succumb to. There is a problem of inefficient quality. You know, once you're locked in, they can, they don't, the business doesn't need to do anything to keep you. And they can put you at the end of the queue in terms of getting the best service. So all of these reasons suggest that sometimes no contract is better to av in avoiding these inefficiencies. They also, and I think a lot of people might get a sense that there is something not just so rational going on, that the businesses are in some sense preying on mistakes that people make. So what happens when people are imperfectly rational? Well, a lot of things might happen, but I want to focus attention to a few types of biases or mistakes that individuals might make. First of all, when you sign up for these lock-in contracts, you might not know that the prices will go up. That is somewhere in the fine print. In year two, we will, throw, we will jack up the price. That's what happened to a lot of subprime borrowers in the mortgage crisis, right? They got these great interest rates. Now, to every rational actor, everybody should know these are not, you're not going to get negative interest rates for a long time. At some point, you're going to be positive and high. But people made mistakes, <coughs> didn't realize how high. So they underestimated the future price of credit. You can underestimate future price of anything. You might overvalue the immediate perks, the teaser rates, the loss leaders are valued, but to a rational actor, they are only, you know, they should, they should be offset against other things. But when you see them there, ringing in front of you, you might be a kind of seduced. My co-author Bargill wrote a very important and influential article titled Seduction by Plastic, about the seduction methods that credit card companies use to get people to sign up and take a lot of debt right on. And people have, consumers have reported this sense of inability to resist the temptation to overcharge, overdraw. People might underestimate the switching cost. You don't know how costly it will be. It's another fine print term, the switching, the penalty fee. And there are a few additional factors. I don't want to oversell. I'm not a huge believer in the, in these, this kind of analysis, I think it's kind of ad hoc, and we have some examples of these biases. We don't know how broad they are. So I want to highlight two factors that are more general here. First of all, people may make mistakes, but they are not stupid. They learn that there are these problems with lock-in contracts. That's why we see the no contract thing being advertised. It's exactly to those among us who have figured out that something is going, something fishy is going on with these lock-in contracts, that those businesses are, you know, are, are going to take advantage of us. So we want the no contract. In fact, we might over, be overzealous in our um, fear of lock-ins. So, so that's, uh, that's a way in which people protect themselves against these biases, learn from them. But they're not stupid, but they might be outsmarted. Sellers recognize that these biases, that people are ripe for these kind of mistakes. And so they'll find new ways to lure them into lock-in contracts. And there are competitive pressures to prey on these biases. Sometimes people say, it's a very Chicago thing to say, that competition will solve these mistakes. Evolution will solve these mistakes. People will learn. 
a competitor will come in and give you a more efficient product without preying on you. But in this context, the competition does exactly the opposite. The more fierce the competition, the more drive there is to take advantage of these biases and to aggravate them. Okay. What else? Um, so what, why else does no contract matter? We talked about what happens with rational actors that they might overconsume in period one, underconsume in period two, and so on. We talked about the, uh, you know, the mistakes that people make, and therefore they might be lured into lock-in arrangements that are not good for them and where they can be um, um, taken advantage later on. Then there is another issue that is more subtle, kind of a law and economics -y topic, and that has to do with relationship-specific investment. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about the types of things that you can do to make the transaction, the relationship, more valuable. Long t we have this, huge, this uh, general um, uh, understanding. It's almost a, a, a now an axiom that in long-term relationships, people invest more in the relationship. There is, if you know you're going to live in a place for many years, you'll plant trees. But if you're only going to live there one year or one month, you're not going to plant trees in the backyard. Other people will eat the fruit. That's the relationship, that's the investment in relation in, that's the investment that we're talking about it would be squandered outside this relationship. In our con consumer context, you know, when people sign up to a particular product, they have to learn it. There is an upfront investment in knowledge. It takes time to figure out all the things you can do on the phone. It takes time to know what is the value of the relationship. In any, many other contexts, knowledge is a relationship specific often. Once you change to a different provider, it all might become stale. And so long-term relationships foster more investment, more, in, more knowledge. More knowledge makes, you, makes it possible to enjoy more the product. Sellers might invest in infrastructure. If they have you bound for two, three years, they'll send a technician and update the cables. Put in more, you know, more electrons can run through. But if, they, if you can walk away any time, it's too risky for them to do that. It's too costly. They can only recoup that investment if they can get the flow of income over several periods. Better hardware. Here I'm thinking of the phone. You know, most people walk around with these very flashy, you know, smartphones that cost a lot of money. If you look how much they cost the device, few people appreciate how costly they really are because we get them free or discounted. You know, a good iPhone 4S costs probably you know, $750 on eBay. So it's, uh, but you, people get them for free. Why? Because they're making the commitment. So there's again an investment that is made by the business in the relationship, giving you a better device to enjoy the service later on. These are all things that require long-term commitment and these are all su suggest an intuitive claim that no contract stifles this investment, uh, re reduces this investment. Businesses will, that if you enter a no contract, if pay as you go, free to leave any time, the business will not send a technician to, inv to upgrade your device, your cables, your knowledge, and all that. It w and that will reduce the value of the relationship. You will have slower cable, cheaper phones, less knowledge, and so on. I think that's wrong. I think that it's wrong, but for a somewhat subtle reasons. Um, first of all, lock-in, it does create more investment, but it, that's not necessarily the best investment. It might be excessive. Do we really need a new smartphone every two years? We throw <coughs> these good devices that just 12 mo 16 months ago would have seemed like futurist, something futuristic, futuristic. We don't want them anymore. Why? Because there's something better. But to spend $750 on a new device, that's a social cost, every two years, seems a little excessive. Might be excessive. I'm just suggesting that the 
free gifts, these bundles, these, these investments that are done in the relationship are not are higher in lock-in, but might be too high. Yeah. So there's wasteful hard work, too much net learning. If you study, if you have a long-term relationship with a particular product network and you begin to learn it and read and figure out everything, yes, you get a lot of knowledge and more enjoyment, but that's not necessarily good, all this investment. Why not have one compatible family of networks where you don't need to learn new things every time you switch a provider? That would be more efficient. So yeah, we get more learning in lock-in, but this is not good. We don't need to burden our consumers with the uh, 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 incentives to, to learn so often. So that's one thing. Lock-in creates, gives you more incentive to invest, but it's not always good, and I think often it is bad and wasteful. No contract, on the other hand, and there, here's a, a, a fairly subtle point, set of points, uh, creates an incentive to make the consumer happy. Because if the consumer is not happy, they walk away for free. These are, you know, they are, they, they are not prisoners of, your, of the business's you know, service. They can walk away anytime. So they need to be lured every moment, every day, every minute. You make one thing, one mistake, one operator is rude to them, they walk away. They'll never come back. So you need to make consumers happy. If that is the case, we would see that in the no contract arrangements, there would be better service. If there's better service, then we see people, there's no exit. People have the right to exit, but they don't. If there's no exit, then the relationships become effectively, not legally, but effectively, practically long in the no contract uh, setting. And if the relationship is long, then there is, an invest, there is an incentive to invest in it. S the whole point was that there is no in invest incentive to invest because the re relationships are short. True, legally they're short, but effectively the incentive structure is such that they are uh, long. So then what the only question that remains that I want to, to quickly say is to ask, which sellers offer no contract? Where would we see these kind of contracts? We see them growing now. Where the, dynamic period where the market is shifting, changing, all these no contract things are, but where will we see a lot of this in the end when things settle and converge? One con conjecture is that this is a subprime phenomenon. Those kind of cheap, cheapos, cheap things that are, you know, prepaid phones, right? The subprime market. That's the classic free exit arrangement. And indeed, if in areas where we think that quality is known to consumers and known to be either low or questionable or suspect, then consumers have a more pressing need to be able to exit. And we would see in that area more exit options offered. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is exactly the reverse. And I kind of think that that is where the market is gravitating. We will see no contract in the super prime, so to speak, uh, uh, sectors or segments of the market. In areas where, you know, if the quality of the service is unknown, if you're not, you're not sure how happy you're going to be, you don't have a reason to suspect that anything piggish is going to happen. You just don't know. Many vendors offering many products, they all look the same, but some will be really good and some will be really lousy. How do you, uh, um, what would happen then? Well, high quality sellers, those that are investing a lot in making their consumers happy, they have less to lose by offering free exit because they're not going to lose anybody by giving free exit. The free exit thing is costly. You let your fish jump out of the net. But if the fish don't want to jump out of the net because they're happy in the net, then give it to them. It, it, this is the idea economists sometimes call it, sig uh, they call it signaling. How do you signal your quality? You tell the consumers, if anything bad happens, you know, cut my head off. <laughs> I know it's not going to happen, so I don't mind making a legally com enforceable commitment to punish myself. These are, you know, heavy, uh, costly warranties are given only by the best automakers. 
seven years, seven million miles. If you, you, you know, which, 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 you know, you all have, you know, you have these backpacks or, or duffel bags that are made by L.L. Bean or that. The best makers will give you a lifetime warranty. The cheapos will not. So it is a way, very few people end up sending these things back. But it's a way to signal to the consumers that this is high quality. No exit is just like a warranty. We warrant your happiness. And if you will be unhappy, don't worry, you don't have to come with us, knock on the door to get money. Just walk away. The best quality vendors will do this. So in fact, no contract here will be offered specifically in those cases where consumers will not want to exit. This is an irony. It's not really a legal term that you need. It's a bit of information. It's a signal of quality that is very important, that will make you happy. And in equilibrium, we will not want to exit, just like the warranty. In the, ve the very good big warranties, you look after seven years, you've owned your car, your Rolls Royce, and you say, wow, I never used the warranty. But you know, maybe there's a sense, a momentary irrational sense of waste. I should have had something to fix. And I, I didn't use that free service. But no, the idea, that's what everybody wants. Seven years of peace of mind. And that's what you want with a no exit, no, no contract. The free exit option is don't make me exit. I'm going to stay, and this is the kind of dynamic that occurs here. Um, this is similar to what we see in high-end retailers give you an option to return the goods. Discount retailers, big lots or Dollar General or something, don't give you. In those areas where you most, when you buy, you know, uh, crap, uh, the more you would want to return, you can't. But when you go to Neiman Marcus and get a very good piece of garment, you wouldn't, you know, uh, you might want to return it for sake of change preferences. But it will never be low quality. That will not be grounds for returns. Uh, and so you have the right to return the good, uh, the, the item for a long time, and you don't exercise it. This is the same dynamic we see here. So this is my uh, presentation, and uh, we have about 20 minutes or so for discussion. So let's uh, open it up for question, comments, debate, um, and No contract scheme. Uh, firms do invest uh, in a relationship, and in fact, because in fact they try to be long. But don't they sometimes count on, on people's laziness or maybe some irrational behavior? In, even if you have the right to exit, you won't always exercise it. Uh, like the minute someone is rude to you or something is not going well, because it has costs. Even <coughs> if you don't have to really pay anything, still, you have to make some effort, right? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that no exit is not really, or f excuse me, free exit is not really free. True, you are not subject to the termination penalty, but you are subject to other switching costs that are not legal, like, you know, just getting out of your routine or learning a new routine or, you know, calling another 800 number with another company that will let you calling this company and getting you off the, their lists or something like this. All of these things are costly and to, to the extent that they, this is a substantial cost, it would meet, moderate everything that I said. The difference between contractual arrangements, termination penalty versus no termination penalty, matters only if without that there are no other overarching, overwhelming switching costs. If there are, then this is all irrelevant. It, people get stuck in contracts because of these other switching costs. I think that as you know, uh, consumers become more savvy, and we said the not stupid bullet that we had, there, they understand that they might, there are other options and they want to be able to switch. People switch, not completely, not that easy. Um, uh, but and there is there there are costs, but 
there are all sorts, there are, there are different mechanisms that develop to help people do that. Um, and when we talk about high stakes arrangements like a three year Bally's, you know, health spa contract, that's a lot of money. If you're not happy, I think with the, all the inconvenience of quitting and finding another place, people might switch. So in those situations where switching other real switching costs are moderate or low, then the legal switching costs become important. Now, just want to mention, there was tremendous amount of litigation and, and some regulation on cell phone termination fees. People got upset about that. I think that suggests that people felt that absent those termination fees, they would switch. So to the extent that this is a real problem, then my analysis is, is relevant. I totally accept the point, though, that in many areas, this is just make-believe. Businesses know people will not switch. It's too costly and difficult, and there are no good options. And they lure you, they prey on you by giving you a false sense of uh, freedom to exit. No contract. Knowing that they can do whatever they want, you'll never switch. There are these scenarios. I think they are less, you know, increasingly less prevalent. Yes, Remy. Um, in your super prime argument, aren't you assuming that consumers have a choice between the no contract and the long-term contract? If we think of a long-term contract up front versus a financing agreement, uh, some subprime consumers may not have access to, uh, because of their credit score, to, to uh, uh, long-term contracts, and so they may be pushed into the subprime contract, and uh, that's why companies like Rena Center might get away with charging higher fees in the aggregate. So, do you, you, okay, let's think together about it. I think you say raising an important set of issues. Let's see how they work out. In, in, in Rent-A-Center, consumers get a long-term contract or a no contract? It's a no contract. Because they can always quit. They can always go and return the I see. So, say here's a subprime market where instead of buying something, Instead of going to a store and purchasing a good and paying and, and uh, now having to make payments, installments for three years, you make three years of payments. In the end, you might own, but you can quit any time. Of course, the, the cost is that these monthly payments in rental center are much higher uh, to give because of this option to, to quit. Uh, I think that, we, uh, that that is one type of model. I think we see in the subprime, I don't know how if to relate it directly to uh, I need to think about it. It's, it's a good, challenging point. I would have thought that we would see more that the financing issue and the difficulty of in the subprime to get uh, to buy things in cash and the need for financing would give an opportunity for predators to not only sell the goods in a lock-in arrangement, but also to make some money in the financing element of the deal. So to make you buy, lend you money, give you a teaser rate so that you will, the money that you borrow seems cheap and then all of a sudden, a few months later, the payments begin to pile up. We also see that. Um, so um, I, th I think that there is, uh, that's maybe that's not a, a complete answer or satisfactory answer to your, I th what I think is going on in these situations is that aside from lock-in versus no contract, we have additional factors playing on and that make uh, what we see is, uh, you know, sometimes these fr freedom to exit like rent-a-center and sometimes uh, these horrible lock-in arrangements where people sign up, get something very small up front and then they're bound for years to make uh, outrageous payments. Yes? To what extent do we see those offering the no contracts creating more real switching costs you know, as opposed to or legal switching costs like you know so that we, we create a higher learning curve to use whatever we're selling to increase to sort of artificially inflate the cost of switching do we see that at all or a lot or not at all so interesting so what i think yes i think you would expect that right to the extent that people make mistakes about switching costs they don't know the legal switching costs we said that was one assumption for example you don't really, sometimes you don't know what will be the termination fee. 
Um, then we might also expect people to not know what will be the termination, the de facto termination cost. So we might learn over time that termination fees for cell phone contracts are, difficult, are high. But do we really know how easy it is? To, do we just pick up the phone, talk and say, hello, somebody there, please terminate? It doesn't work that way. Try to call AT&T for things, you know, that they have an interest to buy something from them. You know, it's in, in the nth uh, attempt, you might eventually speak to someone and get to it, and then it'll get disconnected. You have to start all over again because the phone doesn't have a memory. Uh, and, and it's the 800 numbers that are supposed to give you rights, like termination, are notoriously, there's notoriously very few people on the other side of the line waiting to pick up. And there were a few years ago stories about AOL and someone who tried to, remember that company? Uh, <laughs> someone who tried to terminate and recorded the conversation with the agent who did, did everything to disrupt the ability, the legal right for no contract, the legal right to walk away. So you're on to something very important. However, I think that, again, the, context, the comment, yes, consumers are gullible, but they are not stupid. Everybody knows that. We all know that it's not that easy to walk away. And so maybe the next phase in the no contract tsunami that is washing you know, our consumer market is not just giving people the legal right, but proving to them that they have the de facto power to walk away. Maybe by saying that there is an auto, a default expiration. Unless you affirmatively renew, you're free. There's no auto renewal. In some context, people might want that. Of course, if I'm right, and these are the cases, these are the super prime vendors that give this, then people will want to renew. And then there is the hassle of renewal. So we have kind of a situation where, you know, there's room for interesting in dynamics to develop to both save on transaction costs of renewal, but also not trap people into contract that they have the right to terminate, but that they cannot effectively do. Yep. You talked about the uh, signaling effect, mm -hmm. but don't you think that a seller, is, or that there's the possibility that the seller is over optimistic about his own product, so he would, uh, the quality is not, it's not like he think it is? Mm -hmm. And then what would happen? So a seller that thinks that, he, that it has the best product, is giving people great warranties, it's giving people option to, to leave, and then it turns out the product is not functioning that well, and people invoke the warranty and want to leave, and that seller gets wiped off in some sense, right? Um, you know, I think that to some extent this is what happened in the 90s and the early 2000s to Gateway. Gateway was a, nov a new computer company that had a great business model. They don't just build computers and put them on the shelf. They do business. 1-800-GATEWAY, you call them, and order the computer that you want, just assemble it according to options. Now it's very common to do them, but then it was innovative. And they say, ship it to your home, that machine that you, that you and they give you great warranty, and they thought the best computer. Everybody bought gateways. And then it turned out that the machines were not that good. You've all studied cases about, you know, someone, Gateway, Hill v. Gateway, Klossek versus Gateway, Brower versus Gateway. Uh, oh, the list is long. Gateway, there were a lot of cases brought against Gateway because there was a very handsome warranty. They thought that they are super prime. They gave it. And they ended up being not that good. And so a lot of claims were made. They couldn't handle everything. And consumers, in, some, in many cases, ended up without good remedies. But the good news is that Gateway, what's their market share now? It's kind of zero point. Anybody has a gate? I always ask my, anybody has a gateway? It used to be, you know, half of the class had. Now, you know, people are ashamed to raise their hand. <laughs> um, so they still might be, they might may be making a comeback. I don't want to insult anybody's laptop. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is, uh, that's, the same thing could happen, I think, with no contract. It, might be given uh, too optimistically by, part, by businesses who are trying to signal something that they cannot, they don't, cannot credibly do. So, yeah. Couldn't the seller insure, or the company could insure 
rate itself and then um, ask for a, for a risk premium and price that in. That would be an efficient solution. Yes, so uh, you're right. I mean, partly, why do companies want to signal their high quality? For one, they want to get business. But not just that, they want to charge high prices. You know, Rolls Royce gives you a long, a, a very long warranty. LL Bean gives you a very good warranty, but the prices are also premium prices. So that's the insurance. They charge you this additional cost, and then they are supposed to uh, give you something in return. If they didn't give you good quality, they'll give you a repair. If the company did not calculate it right, they thought they will only have small percentage of complaints, and they end up having high percentage of complaints, they can't pay, and consumers don't, cannot recover. But the good news is, again, that these vendors get wiped out. Yes? Um, I have a question kind of specifically to the cell phone market, where previously, like, uh, the no contract had been the subprime market, and we're sort of seeing more new ones. Do you have a specific example of what some sort of super prime cell phone car carrier is doing as a signaling, because they have a long reputation for being a subprime market? Like, how does that switch happen? So how do you climb up using these, and, and do we see the, the rise of a company in terms of its quality also matched with its willingness to offer? Well, I was sort of asking like a new entrant into the no contract market. Maybe if Verizon is the best cell phone carrier, but no contract cell phone plans are, I think most of us would consider them a subprime market currently, and they used to be like, you know, burner phones. So how does, what does Verizon do Consumer-wise, like, is there an example of a company entering the market as a super prime offerer right. that's countering the signaling? So I think that what happens in the phone market is a little more complicated because we are not paying for the phones when we get them. We are paying for them in the course of staying, giving the company guaranteed profit period. Uh, and uh, and that's, uh, people you know, are still lured into this uh, uh, new phone um, culture. And so that would, when that interacts with the actual service itself, the telecommunication service, we don't see a no contract arrangement for the telecom service because they still need to pay for the phones. But uh, in, I think in effect, in phones, we always had a free, uh, a, a no contract arrangement. The only thing was that if you walk away, you don't have to pay anything other than the man, the reasonable profit, I think that's what we have now. You still have to pay the company money that kind of reflects the profit that they would make, but that is, you can think of it as paying back for the phone. They cannot resell it, you cannot return it, and res they cannot resell it, there's no value in the secondary market, so that is the result. Now I think it would be interesting, I think your answer to your question more generally is interesting to think to look around, maybe people have uh, good examples to see how a company that maybe uh, has a more, uh, a, you know, a less striking, less uh, uh, positive reputation, is trying to signal its turnaround, its ascent into the ascent into the uh, prime market, and do they do it? When they do it, do they also do it with the type of signaling methods that I've suggested here? I'm sure that there are examples in the, uh, that we, one can come up with, but don't have one right now that is kind of crisp in mind. Please. Do you see any, any, any grounds for, for the concept of no contract as advertised to be attacked as misleading, as misleading information? Or, or do you think that consumers get that it's just a locking provision? What do you think, Mike? Uh, I, I think um, we have a senior lawyer from the uh, Federal Trade Commission here. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there are, there are grounds to question it. But the, the bottom line would be what a reasonable consumer would understand in the context. And the, the context, socially, we know is such that people understand um, particularly if they've gone through the process and signed up, that no contract has become a synonym or a marketing term for no commitment, no, uh, that um, you have a, an outcome. 
So the, the defense would be it's not misleading because nobody take, understands it literally. People understand it as being a And I would imagine that no government entity, no state or federal agency would go after this. They have more pressing cases of deception to deal with. This is not, nothing bad, nothing bad is happening here. And for one, people are not really misled. And yet it is possible that a private kind of quote unquote private attorney general, a plaintiff might surface in some places and say, this is deceptive. You said something and it's not true. It will just be, I think, very difficult to get any kind of real measure of harm that, uh, uh, as we told you, there's no contract. In fact, there is a contract. How were you harmed? You can walk away. Yes. Um, so you've presented this as a dichotomy between no contracts and lock-in, but it seems that there's infinite room for a continuum. You don't know when you have one unit of consumption or multiple units of consumption. That's a social construct. If I go to a gym and I sign up for 30 days for a month, I might think it's no contract because they're not committing me to a year, but how do I know if I shouldn't be getting just one day and paying each day? So I'm wondering if in your research you came across any instances where you weren't quite sure whether you had something that was no contract or not. Right. It's a good point. And that is a, it's a, there's a methodological point here on the... the wedge between the way we think of things, you know, a scholar would think about it within a model and a messy real world. There, you know, no, lock-ins, a lock-in is not a single regime. As you said, it can be, it can vary in duration. It can vary in the cost of termination. You can have a $10 termination fee and you can have a $10 million termination fee. Surely it would not have the same effect. But I think what we can learn from this kind of perspective is what is the effect of an added measure of lock-in. The more you are locked in, the longer the period, the higher the termination fee, the more we will see the kind of effects that we have discussed here. Um, the, more, the, the weaker the lock-in, the closer it is in effectively to a no contract, the less important these effects are, and you could say, you know, okay, you are locked in for one day. Yes, there will be these effects. It will be microscopic. So that's, that's the best response I can, I can make. Kind of think about it as a qualitative study more than quantitative. Anything else? You have classes to go to, and do we have a little more time? No? Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you.